All right, 1 Samuel chapter 1 is where we're at, and I uh, forgot to mention earlier, but, but afterwards, moms and families, if you guys want to hang around after the service, there's, uh, we've, uh, people in our church have set up just a beautiful little like tea area out there. You can grab some tea and um, some uh, sweets with your family. We would love for you guys just to hang out and fellowship with us if you feel led to do that. Um, so for this morning, I wanted to, I know for maybe many of you who've been, come on a regular basis on Sunday morning, you'll know we've been going through the book of Isaiah, but honestly, uh, it just felt right to do something more specific towards Mother's Day this morning. Uh, that's the way kind of the Lord was leading me today, and I needed a break from Isaiah, and I don't think it's bad that we take a break from Isaiah. <laughs> Too much prophecy is bad for the soul. We need, we need a break. We need to cleanse, so. Um, so I'm looking forward to 1 Samuel, but this message today is about uh, a very important mother in Scripture, but fathers, please don't, you know, pack up your Bibles and start closing your eyes right now, okay? This, this message is for all of us, all right? Mother, father, kid, son, daughter, uh, because this, what I want to talk about not necessarily is something that's just exclusive to moms. This is about an aspect of the character of a mom in scripture that I really appreciate and enjoy. And if you can see it up on the screen, we're going to be talking about Hannah, and we're more specifically going to be talking about her perseverance and her, her, her willingness to continue to go before the Lord and her, continue, her continued faith in the midst of the circumstances that were around her. And really that's what perseverance is. Perseverance is the willingness to continue on in what you're doing in the face of trials and in the face of difficulties in your circumstances. That's what Hannah's going to exemplify for us. And this brought me back, thinking about Hannah and her perseverance, brought me back to what I believe was probably my very first sermon, now that I'm thinking about it and looking back. When I was in sixth grade, I, was, uh, I attended a Christian school in my uh, hometown of Quispam Sis. New Brunswick, Canada. That's where I was living. That's where my family was at the time. And at the time, at this little Christian school in my English class, our teacher decided that she wanted us all to write our first speeches. And so we had to write speeches about something, someone, uh, a, an aspect of the Bible or a person in the Bible in some way. And so at that time, I decided to write my speech about the person of Job. And I wrote about Job, and I talked specifically about Job's perseverance. That was my first ever, what, you know, now looking back on it, that was, that was God preparing me even then for my first sermon, all right? And so I, I decided to study Job right through all these things. And the thing about it was she told us that if you win, if you win this, you know, speech competition or if you're in the top two from our school, that you get to go to a regional speech competition where you get to present these things. And I was a pretty competitive kid. I liked to be good at whatever I was doing. So I was like, I'm going to win this thing. I'm going to win this speech competition. I'm going to go to the regionals. and I'm going to blow their socks off. And so I, I studied really hard for this thing. I studied Job. I, I studied a lot of things about perseverance. I wrote out all my notes on my little cue cards so that I had them ready to go. And I, I went to this speech competition at our school. They had this big, like, kids fellowship hall area with a big stage and so you'd go in there just by yourself and your class. There was probably like 15 of us in the class. And then a few teachers would sit down just in front and you'd get up there with your cue cards and you'd, you'd read your presentation. And I, I knocked that sucker out of the park. They're like, whoa, this is, this is like Billy Graham up there at sixth grade in young form. They were, they were, I mean, people were falling over in their seats. They were getting saved left and right. It was incredible. No, probably not. But I did get second place, which was good enough to go to the regional. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Thank you very much. Which was good enough to go and which gave me my big enough head that now I can, you know, do what I do today. But anyway, uh, it, uh, it gave me this opportunity to go and went to this regional competition. And I don't really remember how I did there, but I, I remember that moment sticking in my mind forever about that I've never forgotten that speech. I've never forgotten about that perseverance of Job. You know, really the only thing that I remember other than the perseverance of Job from that speech, from that opportunity, was we went to this regional competition. I don't remember anything about the competition other than we got to stay in an Econo Lodge, which was like the, the Ritz-Carlton when you're in sixth grade. It had a hot tub. It was beautiful. It was great. That's, those are the only things I remember, except that I remember about the perseverance of Job. And as I was reading for this passage this week, I was reminded about the importance. Job shows it, and then we're about to see it in Hannah, about in the Christian life, what it looks like to have perseverance. 
And what it made me think of, not just about Hannah, Hannah exemplifies a lot of things that we see in, in, in just being a mother. In, in, you know, it comes in fathers too, but especially in the mothers that are in this room is that there's a level when you have kids, and I know my mom was this way. I'm sure some of you remember your moms being this way or, or you have been this way with your kids. When there is something that you care about so deeply, when there is something that matters to you so much, you will take whatever steps, you will go through whatever difficulties, you will walk through whatever things are hard to take care of that thing, to make sure that your son or daughter, if they're going through something difficult or they're walking through something hard, that's, that drives you to your knees, that drives you to prayer, that drives you to, to want to be with that more than anything else. And what an important quality that is to be able to say, man, things are hard, things are difficult, and to have the selflessness to say, it isn't even necessarily about me. Lord, would you take care of this other person? Would you watch out for this other person? That willingness to have perseverance is a quality that not just mothers, not just fathers, sons, daughters, that all of us could, could, could stand to gain in our walks with the Lord as we walk with Jesus. And so kind of the key idea, the, the big thing I want us to, to take away from the story of Hannah this morning that I hope we see is that the, the Lord remembers the perseverance in prayer of his people. The Lord remembers the perseverance in prayer of his people. And we're going to see this in the story of Hannah. And if you haven't heard it before, this is an incredible story, and I, I'm excited to share it with you this morning. So let's read this together. Starting in the first verse of the first book of 1 Samuel, it says, Now there was a man from Ramath and Zothan, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives, and the name of one was Hannah, and the name of other was Paniah. And Paniah had children, but Hannah had no children. This is where right in the first couple verses we're introduced to the problem that we're going to see in this passage. You can tell right away what kind of the main thrust of this passage is going to be is that there's this man, Elkanah, who's got two wives. One of them has children, and one of them does not. And this is a problem. This is a, you know, an issue that is not reserved to, to just this story here. There are stories throughout Scripture. Well, not throughout. There's a, there's a couple other stories we see. One of them if you remember, Leah and Rachel is another one where there are a man with two wives where one can have children and another cannot. And the burden that is going to be placed on these things, the, the struggle that that's going to be for the one who cannot have children versus the one that can. And you see in verse 3, now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of armies in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Paniah and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, because he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, moreover, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. And it happened year after year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, that she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat." So here's, here's what we find is this problem, is this issue for Hannah, is that she is in this relationship and she's in this marriage where she cannot have kids. And I, 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 don't, this is, I, I don't know if we can even fully grasp what this meant to a woman at that time in the Old Testament to be barren, to not be able to bear children. But over any generation, whether today or back in the Old Testament, I think we can understand the pain that she must be feeling about wanting something so badly and yet not being able to have it. Wanting and desiring something so good, okay, it's not even that her desire is for something evil or for something sinful. Wanting something so badly, wanting something that is good and yet not being able to have it and yet not being allowed to have it. It actually says here, we see that how involved God is in this story, the, it's the Lord that has closed her womb and has not allowed her to have children. And so this is the circumstances that she's in, and it only, I just, I don't know if we can even, as much as it's hard for women in this generation when you find out, hey, you won't be able to have kids, or maybe this won't ever be in the cards for you, 
to, to know in that time and in that place the sorrow and the, and the pain that she must have felt for not being able to have children was so great. Think about the things, and these are not, listen, we're, we're reading about things in the Old Testament right now that are not acceptable, okay? That are not, it's not acceptable for a man to have two wives, okay? Looking at the men in this room, nobody wants two wives, okay? It's just bad. It's just bad. It's silly. It's stupid. Not good, okay? This is not, because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that God's approving of it, okay? So there's a problem already right there with Elkanah and, and the state that this is in. It's, it's not good, all right? And then the things that women would do when they found out that they could not have kids were also not good. There would be women at the time who would allow their men to be with other women just so they could have kids, okay? Not good, not okay. There, there are, are, are women who, who, when, you know, it's, 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 it's a bad situation made worse by the sinful choices of the people, okay? And then on top of that, not only is Hannah not able to do something that she so desperately wants to do, but she has this other woman over here who is constantly provoking her, who is constantly rubbing it in her face that I am the one who's able to provide kids. Look what I'm able to do that you're not. Look how I'm able to take care of this and you're not able to do that. Imagine how hard that must have been for her. Imagine how difficult that must have been. Just that provoking spirit over and over. And that, you know, that that is in us as sinful people. You know how I know that? Because it starts as early as our young little kids, okay? You know how many times I've told my son, we'll go somewhere, you know, the other week I, I had to take him to the dentist, he had to have a cavity filled, and that's a hard thing, a difficult, he did such a great job, he did so awesome, I was like, man, buddy, you did so great, like, can I, you know, <laughs> what does dad do immediately after he gets a cavity filled? Let's go get an ice cream, all right, yeah, <laughs> problem on a problem, but whatever, we went and got ice cream, and I said on the way home, I was like, listen, buddy, your sisters didn't get to come. They didn't get to get ice cream. So it's okay that you have it, but you don't need to like rub it in their face and tell them all about it, okay? First thing we get out of the car. What do you think he did? Hey, Harper, look at my ice cream that I got and you don't have one. I just wanted to be like, okay, and that's mine now. But you know, you know that that's built into us, right? That that is a part of just our sinful nature. And that's what Paniah is doing over here to Hannah is, is constantly year after year provoking her. And you know, year after year, Hannah is, is suffering and wanting and desiring to have a child. And it's just not happening. The Lord is not allowing it. And her patience and her willingness to continue to go, to continue to worship the Lord, to continue to go year after year with her husband and the family and to say, Lord, why not me? Why is it not my time? Why is this, why is this not happening for me? There's this problem that just is not working out and, and how... You see, it affects her to the point that she wouldn't eat, right? I think, I don't know if you've ever been in a place before where something just troubles you so much, where something bad has happened or something so difficult in your life that you literally couldn't eat food because that's how much you were sick to your stomach or upset about the things that were happening. That's what Hannah is experiencing year after year with this. And then, to make matters worse, not only is it being provoked, we have this situation, I, uh, this is, you know, probably close to all of our hearts as, as guys in verse 8. Look what Elkanah, dude, foot in mouth. Here we go. Watch this. Then Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Elkanah, dude. All right, your name's already Elkanah. Things are already bad enough for you, all right? Foot right in the mouth. Textbook example of what not to do when someone's hurting and in pain, okay? When someone's hurting and struggling, it's not always the best thing to do and go and say, well, yeah, oh, okay, your life is hard. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry that your life is hard. But isn't your life better than an orphan child in Haiti right now? It's like, okay, yeah, thanks, man. Really comforting. Thank you so much. Like, yeah, okay, it's okay in a certain sense, when someone is hurting, it can be, both, both things can be true, that someone is hurting and in pain, and that truth is still truth, okay? But at that point, what we don't need is, okay, Elkanah was probably a good husband. What he didn't need to do at that moment was remind her, hey, aren't I better to you than ten sons? When someone is hurting and in pain, sometimes the thing that they don't need is to say, yeah, but, you know, why don't you consider this over here? Sometimes it's okay 
just to hurt. You know who, who shows us that? Jesus, right? In his own life. Look at the story. Remember the story of when he raises Lazarus from the dead, right? He goes to see Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, and he knows that he is about to bring Lazarus from death back to life, and yet what does he do with them? It says he cried with them. He wept because of the sadness in his heart. There was both truth and sadness in that moment. It's okay. We don't need to try to counteract. Guys, we don't always need to try to fix things, okay? Sometimes it's okay that things just hurt. And things, are, and things are hard, and things are difficult. So Elkanah puts his foot in his mouth and doesn't help anything. But then it says in verse 9, Hannah got up, and after eating and drinking in Shiloh, now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she made a vow and said, Lord of armies, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your bondservant and remember me, and not forget your bondservant, but will give your bondservant a son, that I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come to his head. Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was only speaking in her heart, and her lips were quivering, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought that she was drunk, and then Eli said to her, How long will you behave like a drunk? Get rid of your wine. But Hannah answered him and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman despairing in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your bondservant a useless woman, for I have spoken until now of my great concern and provocation. So this is where Hannah, she goes to the temple to pray after all of this, after feeling what she's feeling, not being able to eat. And she decides she's just going to go one more time before the temple of the Lord and just to pray. And it says that she was so, think about how distressed she must have been for the priest who was sitting there to think that she was drunk because there was so much pain, because she was experiencing so much hurt from the fact that she could not have a child like she wanted to, that she could not take care of these things the way that she wanted to. And all the hurt and all the pain. And so she's praying in her heart and yet her lips are moving. And, and so Eli thinks that she's drunk and she says, no, my Lord, I'm just, I, I am just in despair. I'm just in despair over the things that are happening in my life. And so I've come to pray. And think about even the words that she prays to the Lord. Lord of armies, if you will look on the affliction of your bondservant and remember me. And not forget your bondservant. I will give, if you, if you will give your bondservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. <sighs> Hannah makes this vow before the Lord. And she says, Lord, if you will give me a son, then I will give him back to you. That he may live in service to you all of the days of his life. This gives you some perspective into what Hannah is feeling, the depth of what she's feeling in this moment. How she's struggling in this moment is, is she is struggling so intensely, so much so as to say, Lord, I don't even want this. I, I don't want this just for myself. I want him so he can serve you, so I can give him back to you. This is, this is not just to, to make a vow like this in the day and age that Hannah is making a vow was, was of the utmost seriousness. Right? It was so serious for her to go and to make this vow because of how seriously they took vows back in the Old Testament. If people did not hold to the vows that they made, they would be, they'd be put to death for being unfaithful to the vow that they made. And so for her to make this vow is a serious thing. It's not just, I'm sure, and it's not an unnatural thing, right? How many there have been moments, whether in a TV show or in a movie or, or maybe even your own life, that you've seen people who are in such distress and such pain that they would say, oh, Lord, if you would just help me with this, if you would just save me, if you would just protect me, I will give my life to you or I will turn my life around, right? This is not a vow made flippantly. This is Hannah saying, Lord, my desire is for a son, and I believe that you can provide that for me, and I can believe that you can take care of me. And if you do, I will dedicate him just to you, Lord, because that's how much I care and how much this distress is on my heart and how her focus isn't even on, Lord, just, just do this for me, but, oh, Lord, what could he do even for you? And you know what? The, this is kind of a, 
a foreshadowing thing here, but I think you guys know all the way that the story is going. But in a few minutes, we're going to see that the Lord does provide a son for Hannah. He does answer her prayer. And you know what the most amazing thing uh, just like struck me about the story this week? Is that Hannah prays for the son and she does honor her vow. She takes, she takes care of her son until he's weaned and then she gives him to the temple in service of God. Samuel ends up living with Eli, who's the priest that's mentioned here. And Samuel, her son, will become the last judge of Israel before Israel decides to start taking kings. And the cool thing about what Samuel does is Samuel is actually the man that goes and under the direction of the Lord selects David to be the second king ever over Israel. And that through the line of David is that one day we will realize and see is that the Savior, Jesus Christ, will come through the line of David. All because, all starting with a woman who was hurt and who was in pain and who was saying, God, not even just so that my will would be done or that so my needs could be satisfied or that I could feel better, but Lord, for you and so that you would get the glory. I want to have a son, and Samuel comes, which leads to David, which eventually, years and years later, leads to Jesus Christ, who saves the entire world. Just the beautiful connection, and it all starts because of the persevering prayer of Hannah to go before God and say, please, hear my cry. Hear me. I am in pain, and I need help. Would you go with me? Because she was willing to keep going. And it said, I love how it noticed earlier, year after year, Hannah was doing this year after year. Church, there, there may be some problems in your life. Maybe you've given up praying about certain things. Maybe there's certain things in your life that you've just given, you, you've stopped praying about or you've stopped taking before the Lord because you've said, well, I prayed about this for six months or I prayed about this for a year or I prayed about this for five years and God didn't answer my prayer or he didn't do what I wanted him to do or he didn't respond how I wanted him to respond. And here's Hannah's example saying year after year after year, she would go before the Lord and say, God, please, please, please help me to have a son. Please help me to have a child. Please heal this condition that I am in. She would go year after year and year after year, the answer would be no. Year after year, the answer would be not yet. The year after year, the answer would be wait and she'd keep coming back to pray. Do we have the willingness to say, I don't know what that situation is for you. I don't know if for you, you want so desperately your kids to know Jesus Christ. And they won't go to church and they don't follow and they, and, and they won't listen and then da 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 Or they feel like they're far from God. Are you willing year after year to go before the Lord and say, God, please take care of my kids. Please help my kids to be saved. Please bring my kids back to you. Do you have a family member, a mom, a dad who doesn't know Jesus Christ, who, doesn't, who you don't believe is on their way to heaven? And year after year, you've prayed for them. Year after year, you said, Lord, please come through. Please take care of me. And it, and it hasn't happened. Are you willing to continue to fall before the Lord and just say, God, please? I want to give you just as an encouragement, a real world. Okay, this is... This is an example that just happened just this past week. So many of you know the story of Hal and Sandy and just the things that they've been walking through with Sandy with her cancer journey and, and just many of the things they'd had to navigate. And Sandy's been in the hospital for the last six weeks. All right, and Hal learned last week that Sandy was going to be you know, sent home because the, the hospital was basically you know, kicking them out. They were coming to the end of their time. They were saying, listen, there's, there's no more reason for you to be here. You have to go. And Hal was trying and trying to get her into a rehab facility, into a place that she could go because their house, they didn't feel like they were equipped to take care of her and do all the things that they needed to do to take care of Sandy and, and all of these different things. And, they, and rehab kept rejecting them and rejecting them and rejecting them. Basically, because she has stage four pancreatic cancer, they said, you know, we're not going to put her in a bed. We're not going to put her here because she's going to die anyway. And so they're getting rejected and rejected, and Hal's getting more and more nervous. What, what are we going to do? And he's texting me, and we're just, every day, we're just saying, Hal, I'm praying. Hal, I'm praying for these things. He, I know he was texting others in the church saying, hey, please pray. We were praying, Lord, please open up a spot. We prayed last week here in church, Lord, please help her case to be seen by somebody. It keeps getting rejected. It keeps getting rejected. Up until the very day 
before she's supposed to get released. And you know what Hal told me this week? He said he was praying on his way to the hospital, driving over. And they had just been rejected the day before, but they resubmitted. They were, they were told, hey, you can submit this case, and, and they'll look at it. They'll examine it. It'll probably take two weeks. But then maybe after the end of two weeks, they'll, they'll, heal your, they'll hear your appeal, and maybe you'll get in after that. And Hal told me he was just on the way praying. And as he was praying, he just he said, I don't know what it was, Sam, but it, just the peace of God just covered my heart. And I was like, just felt the sense, Lord, you're going to take care of this today. And he came into the hospital that day, and just an hour later, they told him, insurance has approved your request. They've opened up a bed at a rehab facility, and Sandy's good to go. And just the faithfulness of that to say, this has been rejected over and over and over, and it's not happening, and it's not going through, and there's no sign, and everyone's telling that, look, when it gets rejected, it's just not, you can submit an appeal, you can do all these things, but it's probably not going to work. And then... The peace of God to say, I've got you. I'm going to come through. And that was just a couple weeks of praying, church. Sometimes we're asked to continue in perseverance to go before the Lord for a lot longer than that. Are we willing to say, God, I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to keep trusting that you're going to come through because I believe that you can and I believe that you will? Are we Are willing to have that same heart of perseverance that Hannah had? And then watch what happens to end this story. I love this part. At the end of this interaction with Eli, it says, Then Eli, in verse 17, answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your request that you have asked of him. And she said, Let your bondservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went on her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Talk about, you know what the answer to Hannah's prayer was in that moment was peace for her heart. She leaves and it says her face was no longer sad and she ate and she had peace. Eli tells her, go in peace. She was able to leave and go away no longer sad because she had the peace of God guarding her heart. Sometimes, church, the answer to the prayer to the thing that you're praying for Sometimes the resolution to the prayer of the thing you've been praying for and kneeling over with God, the thing you've been bringing before the Lord, sometimes Hannah leaves and is the perfect example of she has peace in her heart without even knowing if God's going to answer her request yet. Sometimes what God gives us as we pray before him and as we come before him, as we fall down on our knees before him is not, here's everything you wanted, it's here's my peace that will guard you as you walk through this season. Sometimes that's what we need from the Lord, is that you're praying for this thing and you're praying for this thing and you're pleading before the Lord. And sometimes what you get in that moment is not an immediate answer to what you're asking for. Sometimes what we receive right there and then is peace. Because God promises us when we bring our prayers and requests before the Lord that the peace of God which passes all understanding, guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we have to get to a place where even in these difficult and tough circumstances that we're walking through, what God does is he comes and he covers our heart and he gives us peace in that moment. And that's what we needed right there and then. I love Hannah. She did not even know yet what God was going to do. She didn't know that God was going to give her a child yet. And so she, it says she still walked away in peace. She walked away smiling because she had the peace of God which was guarding her heart, not even knowing yet what was to come next. So then what we see in the next set is that the Lord remembers. It says in verse 19, Then they got up early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son and named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. The Lord remembers. It's not that he forgot, okay? The wording there is not like you and I when it's like, Oh man, I remembered. I promised I'd do the dishes, right? 
Hannah wasn't having, not having kids just because the Lord forgot about her. It's because the Lord saw her in her distress. He saw the perseverance of her prayers. And he said, Hannah, now is the time. And God, it's important to remember, church, that in these aspects of our lives, God is in control of these things. God is in control of even the things that you feel like you're supposed to be in control of, right, in your lives. You know, kids tend to be one of those things. Everyone just expects, I'm sure Hannah just expected, you get married or, you, you know, you get together, you get married, you, you, you know, you're with your wife and your husband, and then certain time when it's time when you decide, hey, this is the time we're going to have kids, that's when it happens, but even God, God is in control of those things. God is in control of the children that we have. He takes care of those things. And he remembers Hannah here and he provides for her a son, Samuel. And just what I explained earlier, Hannah takes Samuel and she honors her vow. She weans, she takes care of Samuel until he's weaned. And then she takes him to the temple and she dedicates him to the service of the Lord. Imagine even how hard that must have been for Hannah Imagine how hard that would be for you. I don't care what generation you find yourself in, whether the Old Testament or this one, to be able to take a child, you know, say, I don't know what the cultural time, age that a child would be when they're weaned in that time, but let's say, you know, three, four years old, you know, when they're, when, to take a child at that age and to take them to the temple, to take Harper, to take Carmen to the, Harper and Carmen being dropped off at a temple together, being like, here you go, guys, figure it out. Wow, that's a disaster. The temple would be destroyed in a couple days. Um, <laughs> taking a child of that age and say, here you go, and, and to say, Lord, I trust you. And you know what it said? Year after year, Hannah would do is every year. She would make clothes for Samuel, and she'd bring them to him every year when she'd come back at Passover to worship with her family. And she had this son, and she immediately gave him back to the Lord. But does it say that she was then sad again because she gave her child? Does it say that she was? No, actually, the entirety, which we don't have time to look at today, just briefly want to read you one verse. But it says that after this, all a big chunk of chapter 2, 10 verses, is devoted to Hannah's song of praise to the Lord for what he provided for her. There's one verse in there that says, My heart rejoices in the Lord, in verses 1 and 2. The, is the, the, in the Lord my horn is lifted high my mouth boasts over my enemies for I delight in your deliverance there is no one holy like the Lord there is no one beside you there is no rock like our God Hannah has to give Samuel back to the Lord she doesn't get him to be in her house all the time and around her and yet and yet she realizes this is not about me this is not just about what I want Lord this is about you and so she gives her child back to the Lord, and she does so gladly with hearts of praise, saying, God, this is your child. Take her and take control. And you know what? The hardest thing even to think about sometimes and some of the hardest, something that I've started praying even just after studying this story this week is just being reminded that my kids are not my kids. My kids ultimately, they don't belong to me. They're not, you know, my possession. They're not, they're really the Lord's. And I'm just, just like God's called me to be the pastor of this church and to just, this is not my church, this is God's. He's the shepherd of these people. He's the one in charge of Pathway Community Church. He's in charge of Sawyer and Harper and Georgie. I'm just the one who has the privilege to shepherd them. Holland and I joke all the time. We're like, tell our kids, all, you're not, okay, so when you get older, you're going to buy the house just down the street, right? So that, yeah, you're close all the time. Okay, yep, good, okay, yeah. And now they don't get it. They still, Sawyer still thinks he's marrying Harper, okay? So they, they're not, they don't understand yet. But that's what I, what my desire, of course, I want, oh yeah, God, just keep them close to me forever. I always want them to be right there, right down the corner, and yet, Ultimately, my prayer for them is, Lord, they are not mine. And God, I want them to go wherever they need to go to be obedient to you. I want them to live whatever life they're supposed to live, as long as that means they're walking with you and living for you and being obedient to your plans for them. If they're doing that, they could be in Timbuktu, and I'll be happy. 
is they're, if they're following the Lord. That's what Hannah gives up here. That's what I hope I can live out in my parenting. That's what I hope we hope as parents for our kids is that they love the Lord and follow Jesus. And anything else, whether they're a lawyer or they're a pastor or they're a doctor or they're a garbage man, if they love Jesus and are following him, that's, that's what matters. And I just love the end of this story because Hannah praises the Lord and then it says the Lord's abundance. At the end of chapter 2, in verse 21, it says, The Lord indeed visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew up before the Lord. Hannah prayed for all of these. All she wanted was just one, just one child, one son, one daughter. God gave her that one. She gave him back to the Lord. And then she had five more for a woman who couldn't have any fruit. The abundance of the Lord. The Lord is faithful and takes care of us. And he is so gracious to us. If there's something, I think any of us, like I said, not just for mothers, but for all of us today, if there's things that we can do to kind of make this practical for us, if there's an action to take, church, my, my call to you is to persevere in prayer. James 5.16 tells us that the prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. Praying is not a waste of time. It is not in vain. It's not for nothing. When you feel like there's nothing else to do, when you feel like there's no other way to fix this, God, I've done everything else that I can, there's always the opportunity to pray. And sometimes it's all every time. It shouldn't be the last thing. It should be the first thing that we take before the Lord and are willing to say, God, I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep seeking these things because I believe that you can do it. Can I, we're going to pray for something just here in the moment. I, I just, this is just a confession to you of how I struggle with these things. Okay. I am not the man of greatest faith. All right. I still, I'm confessing that to you now. I still struggle with these things. Let me tell you, even this morning, God's using my own sin to, to humble me and to hopefully be an example this morning. But just, there was, you know, Moses, one of the teenagers in our church, if you saw, there's a prayer email that went out yesterday. He struggles with a real bad eye issue and, and uh, we had actually had to take him home. This, he was here this morning, but they had to take him home. And his, his eye issue is so extreme that it caused a tear in his cornea, you know, which is, I got a wood chip in my eye last week and was down for like two days so I can't imagine a tear in your cornea and just what the things that he's dealing with and you know we've prayed for him before and we've 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 anointed him and prayed over him and David Boda one of our elders texted me this morning and said you know I really feel led we need to pray for Moses this morning we need to pray for the total and complete healing of his eye and you know what my first thought as I'm driving to work that's running through my head is is like but we've already done that nothing's happened it didn't heal nothing was healed it you know my first thought is god's just gonna make him live with it and it's you know that's just how it's gonna be just this pessimistic lack of faith attitude of just god you know even looking at da why would david ask that why would david want us to do you know we've already it's it's done it's i'm sorry moses just had, and just telling you this lack of faith this lack of belief in my own heart that we prayed for this a few times and I'm ready to give up and I'm ready to say, okay, let's just stop praying. God doesn't want to heal. It's, it's good. And here's Hannah praying for years and years and years, believing that, Lord, would you please provide? And it took years for the Lord to answer. And he did. Just telling you, this action to take, I need it just as much as you. I need this reminder to say, I need to be reminded to persevere in my prayer for people because I struggle with my own faith to believe that the Lord's going to do it. There's a prayer to pray, Lord, give peace to my heart. Give my heart peace as I wait on you because sometimes as we pray, the answer is not always right away, immediate, right when we want it. Sometimes the answer to our prayers we saw with Hannah is just that we walk away with the peace of God guarding our heart. And if there's a praise to repeat, thank you, Jesus, that you are with me in my distress. 
and thank you that you care about my hurt. Jesus does. He cares when we're struggling, when we're hurting, when things are hard. Just like when Hannah was in distress, he cared about her. He cares about the situation that you're in. He cares about the struggle that you're walking through. God cares about those things. And he hears us in our prayers. Are we willing to persevere and to keep praying and to keep trusting that the Lord is faithful in those moments? Father, we 